And like in past weeks, they did all the heavy lifting, but I get the fun. And so I get to light our candle for joy this morning. And Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. If I've not had the pleasure of meeting you yet, my name is Neil Davidson, one of the pastors here at Hope Chapel. If you're joining us online, it's great to have you with us in our service as well, whether you're watching it with us in real time or whether you're watching it at a later time in the week. There we go. That went rather seamless this morning, getting that off. It's great to have you, especially if you're with us online. We really would love for you to reach out and try to connect with us. Uh, you know, we really believe that, that being a part of God's family is being a part of his earthly family as well, which is called the church. And we'd really love for you to be more than just a, a login online, but to really have a chance to have a great relationship with you as well. So we'd love for you to share. And as Jack mentioned, you can do that right through our we website. There's a connect card link there, and that'll get the information right into us, and we'll reach out to you. We'll take the initiative. We won't bug you, but we'll reach out to you and try to connect. Hey, let me have, just kind of fill in a little bit more about what Jack shared with you about what's coming up on Christmas Eve. All right, so that's just a little under two weeks away. So we are going to offer an online experience. For those of you who are either just can't make it here on Christmas Eve or it's not a great fit for you, and those of you who are online, we will be offering an online Christmas Eve service. In fact, I don't ever anticipate us not offering some form of an online experience going forward. And we're going to offer that at multiple times. We're going to make it easy to find, so we're going to premiere it three different times at 4.30, at 6, and 11. And that service will be not right around the neighborhood of an hour, 50 to 60 minutes. We're also going to do an outdoor service for the diehards who just want to come out. And some of that is me, because I love Christmas Eve services. And, but uh, we, uh, we know we can't get enough people inside of the building, so we're going to go outside. Now, if it's 38 degrees and pouring... We are not going to hold the service, right? If you want to come and have a service, we'll leave the stuff for you out here underneath the portico. You can come. The rest of us are just going to do it online. But weather permitting, which we're really praying it will be, we will be doing a stand-up outdoor Christmas Eve service at 5 o'clock. So um, it'll be kind of like a carol sing, but we're going to read the Christmas story. We will have a brief message. We're going to try to get some fire pits going to add a little warmth as well as light. And uh, we know we have some people who might need to stay in their cars when they arrive, so we're going to try to put it in a place in our, on our property where you can stay in your car and still participate. It's going to be a cappella, right? So we're going to just sing with our voices. We're not going to set up the whole band, that kind of stuff. It should be really great. And then we'll conclude the service as we usually do as we're singing Joy to World and si Silent Night and all that kind of great stuff. We'll be singing. We'll light the candles together. And we have some uh, great flashlights for the kids to have that they can keep kind of as a gift. So that'll be a 5 o'clock on Christmas Eve. So, hey, I, I wanted to take just a moment and pray. You know, um, all of you, it's, us, it's, it's hard not to be exposed to the news to say that, we're, especially in our region, we're kind of in a fresh surge with all of this COVID-19 stuff that's going on. Felt a little bit more personally, a former colleague of mine that I served with for, for a number of years at the Baptist Convention of New England, he passed away this week from COVID implications, uh, now out in Oklahoma. After he retired earlier this year, they moved back to Oklahoma, and he passed away from COVID-related implications. We've actually had people who've been a part of our activities, observing all the protocols, but been a part of our activities, and then within you know, 48 to 72 hours after being here who have developed symptoms and eventually tested positive, and we're communicating with everybody as we need to as a part of that, but that shows how close it's getting as well, right? It's something that's right with us and, and that kind of thing. So we have, fan, we have uh, I have some folks in my life group who have cl very close family members who have really kind of been right on the brink about whether or not they're going to make it to recover from COVID. So there's a lot of different stuff like that going on. So I just want to take a moment and pray. And, uh, you know, because we've got a lot of hope in the vaccine, but our real hope is in God, right? So let's pray for just a minute, and then we'll get into our message for today. God, we, we, we are grateful that you are in charge. I think I join a lot of folks here today saying that I don't really understand why all of this COVID-19 stuff is happening and, and how does it fit into your plan, if you will. But, Father, I know that you have the power to put an end to it. I know you have the power to protect individuals who are struggling with it. And, Father, that's what we pray for today. Father, we pray that there would just be a miraculous eradication. And, Father, not only would allow us to go back 
to kind of normal, even the way that we worship would go back to normal for us. But Father, more importantly, it would bring glory to you. Father, we do pray for those families that we are aware of who either are grieving, like my former uh, ministry partner who just passed away from this week. His family is grieving his loss. We have families that are, are deeply concerned as they have parents and cousins and, and nephews and others who are really struggling life and death kind of battles to survive. And so, Father, we just really pray for your comfort and your healing in those scenarios. So, God, uh, and, and so we just really pray for you to be at work. Father, we pray now in these moments we have ears to hear. You know, so there's, there's a lot of din out there right now, and sometimes it's really hard to allow your voice to speak through the din, and we pray that today we would hear you clearly, for we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You know, when I, I thought about the series we're in right now called Christmas Can't Be Canceled, one of the things that kind of led me in this direction and to draw out some truths that just can't be taken away from us was a conversation that, that um, Christina and I had with, you know, one of the neighbors in our neighborhood, you know, that for them... Christmas Eve is one of the highlights of the year. They get all of their extended family together. You know, there's 40 or 50 of them together, right? And they're getting older and have had some health issues. And so one of the things they're asking was like, all right, we're not going to be able to do it that way this year. And what if it's our last Christmas Eve, right? And we never get to do this again. And so, and so what was an event that they would usually look forward to with a great deal of anticipation now they were actually looking forward to it with a sense of uneasiness, maybe even regret or discouragement, right? And 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 because it, it, it the way this is all unfolding, we're in one of these moments where a lot of times when we would encounter an experience that would be something that brings us a great deal of happiness and joy, what we're really experiencing is a kind of like consternation in this place, right? And and you know some of you have felt this year, this year. You know you had graduations that got canceled, or you had grandchildren that were born and you weren't able to go, right, because they only let the father in the hospital and nobody else. And then you felt even nervous about going and being at the home and holding your new grandchild, right? A lot of different experiences like that. And, 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 I, and I just thought it was really significant for us to be able in the midst of all of kind of this, what's spinning around us and the fact that things are really different and we're looking at Christmas differently, right? And one of these strange things, right? If you are planning to get together with a little bit of family over Christmas, usually, you know, a lot of we would look at it with, with a great sense of anticipation, right? Sometimes we'd have a little unease because we don't want to have a family fight, Right? But now we're looking at it with a little bit of guilt, like, I don't want anybody to know we got around with people. Who, you know? And so it's, everything's just getting changed. But I want us to understand that the greatest gifts that God has given us in Christmas are not impacted. And last week we looked at peace. And today I want to look at joy. I want to look at this, this idea of joy. You know, no matter what we're going through right now, we have the ability to live with the great joy that the angels announced. They said, I bring you good news of a great joy, which is for all people. I don't know about you, but I'm a part of the all, right? And that joy is for us, and it's rooted in good news. And so today I want to talk to us about the reason why you and I, despite everything that's going on, can be living our lives with great joy so like I did last week, what I want to start out with by doing is just drawing that connection between Christmas and joy, right? To, to not just to kind of leave, make sure we, you know, we're not just kind of, but see how our joy is rooted in the event of Christmas. It's not just that we're happy that Jesus was born, but that God intended joy to be rooted, to be founded, and to be built on and never impacted by what he did in the Christmas event, the incarnation of his son who came to be our savior. So I'm going to rip through a number of scriptures today. They're going to pop up on the screen. You know, if, if, if you look, a lot of you aren't carrying paper these days because we just don't do that, right? You know, you can take notes in your phone and that kind of thing. You can also go back. 
by tomorrow afternoon on Mondays, usually no later than Monday, we have the, the, we have the service trimmed down just to the message if you want to go back and get a lot of these references. But let's start out with Luke chapter 2. And Paul and Cheryl did such a great job reading this passage for us just a few minutes ago. But on the night that Jesus was born, Right? All of the story is already unfolded, right? John the Baptist has already been born. The angel has visited Mary. The angel has visited Joseph in a dream. They've established their, their new life together. They've followed the orders. They have traveled to Bethlehem to be registered as a part of the census. They're stuck in the stable, right? And, and, and Jesus is born. And right at that moment, the angel shows up, and he talks to the shepherds. Now, the shepherds are outliers, Right? They are not the core people. These are not the people who are walking around the temple like the priests, etc. These are guys who are on the outside of the religious community, if you will, looking in. Right, And it's to those guys that the angel shows up and says to them, don't be afraid. For look, you got to see it, right? Look, I proclaim to you good news of a great joy. Now, I capitalized those, right? So you'd see them better, right? Great joy that will be for all the people. For today, in the city of David, which was Bethlehem, a Savior was born for you who is the Messiah. He's the chosen one. He's the promised one, right? The Christ, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. Listen, let me tell you, Jesus has... In this day, Jesus was born on that night. He still was born on that night. That joy that came for us, that good news that was for all people, it is our good news. And God wants us to be living our lives with a great joy. Let's continue on just a little bit. Now, the Magi, if I got it right, we know in the, in the gospel stories, you read this in, in the gospel of Matthew, there's these guys who are off in the east, and they see this star that appears in the sky. And they travel. And they may have traveled for as much as a couple of years to get, where the, to, to, um, to, get to Israel. Because they've come to see the one who was born king of the Jews. When they get to Israel, the, the star kind of disappears. They don't, so they, they go into Jerusalem. They go to the temple. And they ask, well, hey, where, where's the promised one? We've seen a star. We've seen a sign. Right? And this get Herod all up. And we read the whole story, right, as it unfolds. But when they're directed to Bethlehem and they leave and they see the star, this is what the account tells us. After hearing the king, they went on their way. And there it was, the star that had been seen in its rising. It led them until it came and stopped above the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overwhelmed with joy. Right? When they saw the means of being able to come into the presence of the Messiah, right, the promised one, man, they had great joy. It's rooted in Christmas, right? You continue on. I just, again, let's put it at the far end of the life of Christ, right? He came and is the source of joy, and at the end of his life, he seeks to give it away to us. In John chapter 15, you know, it's interesting that Matthew has this big teaching period of Jesus kind of at the beginning, a little bit in the Sermon on the Mount. For John, he puts a lot of it at the end. And in John chapter 14 and 15, he records for us a lot of the things that Jesus was trying to just, just implant deeply into his disciples before he was crucified. And in John chapter 15, this is what he said to them. He said, these things I've said to you, that my joy may be in you, and your joy could be complete, right? It could be full. Jesus is intentionally communicating to his disciples everything that they need to know so that they can have his joy and the result of his joy is that their joy would ping out at the top of the scale. There is no more room for joy. Right? Their, their bowl of ice cream can't hold one single drop more, not one single drip more. It's all that they can stand, right? And some of you have been around here for a long time, you remember those illustrations that I used to use about the overflowing ice cream bowl, right? And, and God's, so part of the question is, are, do you feel like this morning, do I feel like this morning that I'm living with complete joy? 
And if you're not living with complete joy, this message is for you. Because Jesus communicated some truths to us so that you and I could have his joy and our joy could be full, right? Is your joy full today? So before we unpack that just a little bit more, let me, let me give um, just a, um, a, a couple more things related to this. His resurrection, in other words, the fact that his life didn't end on the cross, but it actually transitioned to his new eternal state as the risen Savior, right? Before he was the preexistent Son of God, now he is the, the eternal risen Son of God who is our Savior, right? It says, when they arrived and they, and they, and they came to the tomb and they saw that they were empty, it was empty, what, what, what did the, was their reaction? It says, they ran away, in Matthew 28, verse 8, with fear and great joy, right? Because they knew that their journey with Jesus wasn't over, right? And neither is ours, and that should be a cause for great joy. We'll get back to that in just a minute. Another passage of Scripture, I'm just pounding it in, right? His master said to him, this is a, 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 an account of Jesus in, in Matthew 25 where he's teaching the parable of the talents. And as each one kind of gets at the end of their journey of service, right? And, and, and as a result of their faithfulness, he says, he looks at it and says, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. God's desire is for us to share his joy now and forever, right? I mean, he wants us to have a great joy. The event of Jesus stepping into our world and then stepping into our lives as we place our faith in him is all designed to give us a joy that is full and never ends, right? It never ends. So one last piece re related to this. You know, well, I'm going to have to wait for that point till later. But I'm going, to, I'm going to cheat just a little bit. When Jesus, a little later in, John, in, the, in, in the Gospel of John, and I'm going to come back to this point, he says, you know what? I'm going, to, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit, and he's going to remind you of everything that I've taught you, and he's going to guide you into all things. And part of listen, God has given us a tour guide so we can live with that joy. We'll come back to that. So what is biblical joy, right? What is biblical joy? You know, and we read in Galatians that, you know, the fruit of the Spirit, the result of having God in us in the presence of the Holy Spirit, which whom we receive when we place our faith in Christ, right? So that, that the Holy Spirit is the agent that allows us to experience the new life in Christ. And the fruit, the outcome of his presence in our lives is what we call the fruit of the Spirit. And Paul, writing for God, put it this way. He says, it is love, it's joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against any of these such things. So God specifically entered into our lives and gave us a new nature in Christ so that you and I could bear fruit, right? It is so joy, biblical joy at its deepest level ultimately comes from outside and is given to us and then it becomes ours. It's a gift, right? It's not something we generate by ourselves, but it is, has its source or its origin in God. And as it is planted in us by our faith and the activity of God in our lives, it flows out and we have joy and it becomes our joy that God has given to us, and it becomes complete. So I, I wanted to try, to try to unpack this just a little bit, right? Because, you know, the word joy and the word happiness are often very much inter, interconnected, right? We, 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 you know, we, we have lots of joy it's because we're happy, if you will. And, and, and happiness isn't inconsistent biblically with joy. Those things can be connected. But the reason for the happiness, the reason for the joy is different, right? So in the, old, in the Bible, the core word for joy that we experience is a word called kara. And though there are lots of different words that are used that, and there's verbal, and there's a verb form in addition to the noun 
form, right? So if you did all the noun forms and all the verb forms, the idea of joy ap appears in these pages over 400 times. But, you know, and, and yet there are other words that are also used along those lines to communicate the same kind of thing. So, like, we might, we might say, you know, I'm, I'm happy or I'm delighted, right? You know, and you can use different kinds of terms that would, you know, that, that would, um, or we're elated. You know, those, they all kind of trying to convey the same kind of idea, but that core word of joy or happiness is the word kara, and it comes out almost almost 400 times in its noun and verbal form, like joy or rejoice, right? Those two kind of idea. And, and here's the difference, I think, between the world's happiness and biblical joy, right? Happiness is, 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 our, is the fleeting feeling we get as a response to something that's happening in our earthly experience. And I'm using a lot of those terms very intentionally, but happiness is, is the feeling that's evoked in us, right, when something good or pleasant happens in our lives. Let me give you a trivial one, right? You know, I, when I, you know, I, I, I enjoyed being an athlete, I love sports, those kinds of things, and, and I got to tell you, it was a delight to me, right? It, it, it's one of the memories I look back on, a great deal of fondness, right, when, when as a senior, in high school, playing tight end for my high school, I, I, my very first touchdown catch was on a flea flicker play with no time left on the clock that led us to victory over our arch rivals for the first time ever, right? And so you look back on that and say, man, that was great, right? But, you know, then we got smucked the next game. So it's kind of a fleeting spirit, right? You know, in fact, I got knocked out and had a concussion and had to leave the game and all that kind of good stuff, right? You know, so it was really the worst injury I ever had playing football or lacrosse, so it's, it's kind of interesting. But, you know, but those are fleeting moments, right? But they're, they're good ones, right? They're good moments. They elicit happiness. They bring a sense of joy, right? But, that's, but when we think about biblical joy, what we're really talking about is a permanent emotion, not just a feeling, but a permanent emotion that is rooted in the gift of God that he's given to us. It's based not on earthly realities, it's based on spiritual realities. And what I mean by that is the joy that God wants us to live with is knowing that there, there, there is nothing that can change the fact that God loves you, has stepped into this history, stepped into human history so that you and I can become his children through faith in Jesus Christ and that we can be destined to go to heaven forever, right? Those are spiritual realities, eternal realities that can never be changed, won't be changed. And, he, and our joy, our, our emotion that it invokes in us is rooted in these unchanging realities. So even though our celebration of Christmas may have to be different this year, and some of you may be actually doing it alone, the, the root cause for joy in Christmas has not been touched. It's not even tarnished. In some ways, it's maybe shining a little brighter because what we're really focusing on the fact is that God cared enough about us who are made in his image that he actually stepped into our world and became one of us so that he could redeem us without us having to do anything to, about it besides receive the gift of faith in Jesus Christ. And that is the joy. So happiness, if you will, or the joy that we experience in earthly scenarios, right, is rooted in things that will change or disappear. But biblical joy is rooted and things that will never change. And therefore, we can live with joy all the time. So that really begs the question, how do you do that? How, how, how do you do that? How do you and I live with biblical joy? And it's interesting. Unlike what we looked at last week about the idea of peace, where Jesus says, my peace I give to you, right? Not as the world gives it, but, you know, I give you my peace. 
This week is a little different. You notice what he said there in, in, in the Gospel of John in chapter 15? He says, I've told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete or full. So part of what he's saying is, I've gotten a gift. I'm giving you the gift of my joy. It's designed to make your joy full, overflowing, complete. But I got to tell you, there are some things that you need to remember if you're going to live with that joy, right? That, that's what he's saying, right? It, it's a gift, but in order for you to really take the gift out and use it to its full, there's some things you got to know, right? There's some things you got to get good at doing or remembering along the line. You know, I, I think of it a couple of ways, right? So um, many of you have been since, through the same journey that I have, right? I, I'm going to be 60 next month. And so, you know, and, and I'm, I've always been, you can ask my wife, I'm always an uh, uh, early adopter of new technology, right? Doesn't that, you know, so I, you know, I was the first guy in my office to have one of the old brick phones, right? You, you know, it, not, I, I don't go back far enough to have the bag phones because that was a little crazy, but I was one of the first guys to have the, 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 the brick phone, right? My family made fun of me. My colleagues made fun of me. I loved having it, right? You know, I, when, when the Motorola Razor came out, I had to go get one of those, right? Because it's just cool looking, right? So, and so some of you are like me, your, your, your parents who grew up in an era before electricity. I mean, my dad moved off the farm when he was 14 years of age. No electricity, no running water, right? And, and you know, so, I mean, in the, in the mid-1940s, you know, moving off of the, in Missouri, down by the Arkansas border, when he moved out of the farmhouse and moved into Springfield, they finally had running water and electricity. You know, so, very different age, right? So when they go to having cell phones, right, it, it's, it's just different. And so, and, and, and there were parts of the ways that they could use their cell phones that they just couldn't remember, <laughs> right? You know, so we'd travel down to Florida, and, and we'd be on the way home from the airport, and my, my, my mom would be handing my phone, her phone to me saying, hey, it won't do this anymore, it won't do that anymore, because somewhere along the line, they had messed it up, right? You know, because I had programmed their phones, if they just press and hold nine, it would go right to their voicemail, right? Well, for, you know, for some reason, they, she had messed that up, got the, and, and, and they just forgot that kind of stuff. So a lot of what the phone could do for them they weren't able to utilize because they never really figured out how to use the technology. Let me give you an example from my own experience. And I've had this happen a couple times. You know, when you play video games, it's a good thing to be all thumbs, right? Because you do almost everything with your thumbs, from what I can tell. And, and, and so I can remember one time sitting down to play a, a football video game with my boys, you know, particularly with my oldest one who was very competitive and really wanted to beat me, right? And I had never played this game with him before, and, right? And, and he's like 12 years old. And so I'm trying, to, I'm trying to play, pick plays, do this kind of stuff, and I have a, no idea what the A button does and the B button does and all that kind of stuff, right? So I'm trying to write, and he's not going to tell me any of it. Right? So I, and, and so he's just crushing me. It's like, it's, like, it's like Arizona, Arizona State, right, over the weekend, 70 to 7 or whatever it was, right? He's just crushing me. And, and I've got all of the ability right in my hands, right? i got the controller in my hands. I can do all the same stuff he is, but I don't know how to use it, right? And then my brother-in-law did the same thing to me. <laughs> Christina's, you know, and, and, and so I gave up playing video games because I am not all thumbs when it comes to video games. I'm all fingers or whatever, you know. And so, but if you don't know, even though you have all of it right there in your possession and you can make, you know, Mario jump and get his power and all that kind of stuff, if you don't know how to do all that stuff, you're just not going to get any of it. And there's some stuff that you and I need to know, right? Jesus said, I've told you these things, right, so that you can actually take this gift of my joy and have it so abound in you that your joy is complete. So how is it, what are the things that we need to know? And, and listen, I'm not going to give you an exhaustive list because I don't have time for it and et cetera, and I'm not sure that's really helpful. I just want to give you some big nuggets, if you will, 
from his teaching in John chapter 14 and 15 for you and I to take away. And there's some stuff that he's already talked about, about peace in this that we looked at last week. We're going to be talking about love next week, so some of the teaching about love I want to, I want to set aside as well. But I, but I want to point out just three major truths to you that you and I need to know if we're actually going to take this gift of God's joy and let it and take it out for the, the ride of our lives so that our joy is complete. And here's the first thing that I want you to, to look at. It comes from John chapter 14. John chapter 14. And, and I just want to look at verse 3. Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's telling them not to let their hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me, and etc. And then in verse th- 3, he says, If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come back again. So Jesus is coming back again. And take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. And we know the way to where he is going. So I I don't want to trivialize what he's saying here, but it's as simple as just saying this life is just a very minor part of the story. Let this sink in for a minute. This life, which we get so fixated on, right? This life is just a very small part of the story. And the rest of it is already guaranteed. Because Jesus is there. The place is prepared. The the sheets are turned down. The mint is on the pillow. Your, 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 Your room in the mansion of God for eternity is all set. You know, and... And, and with that, it just changes the perspective on everything that we're going through here. In many ways, this is the preparation for the eternity that is to come. And he doesn't want us to live our lives outside of that awareness. That no matter what you're going through now, whether it's the greatest time in your life or the hardest time in your life, this life is just a little bit of the prep work for what's coming in eternity. You know, I, I, I try to think about it this way. You know, um, you know it, it, in many ways, what we're experiencing in our 80 plus or minus years here on the planet is, is a lot like doing a rehearsal before the real production of a play. Or, you know, like our song team that's up here on, on a, you know, they're, they're here on Thursday nights and they rehearse for a couple of hours. And then they get here really early, right? And so, you know, they're always trying to hit the note just right, get the words just right, all that kind of stuff. But man, you know, in, in the rehearsal, if you miss a note, you know, and you're a little flat or a little sharp, those are the right terms, right? I don't know hardly anything about music. But if you're a little flat, you're a little sharp or whatever, you say, it's not a big deal because we're just practicing, right? But if you're standing out in front of everybody, like Rick was here with the mic and blasting it out, and you come out flat, it seems like, oh, so like all of life is more like the rehearsal than the performance. Some of you are maybe like me, more into sports. So, you know, if you lose a preseason game, it's not a big deal, right? You lose to your arch rivals, you know, with the conference on the line or whatever, it matters, right? It's, uh, it's like living our lives in pre- It doesn't mean the stuff isn't important, it doesn't, but it's not the real thing. Jesus wants us to remember that our real home is someplace else. And we're just on the journey of getting there. And that can transform every experience that we have and allow our joy to be complete. Here's another thing I want you to see. I've got to turn back a page. Also from the Gospel of John. And it, and it, and it flows out of a number of things that he teaches here in John chapter 15 and chapter 14 and flowing over into 16. And I'm just going to pull out a few things. You know, John, Jesus starts in chapter 15, verse 1. He says, I am the vine, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He says, every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes, and he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. We'll come back to that pruning idea in just a minute. In John chapter 14, verse 12, 
This is what he says. Truly I tell you that the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and he will do even greater works, right? That's the fruit he's talking about, the fruit that we're producing. It's even greater works than he did because Jesus is going to the Father. And then you look down at John chapter 5 again, a little further down in verse, in verse 5, which says, I'm the vine and you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because without me you can do nothing. So what's my point here? God's intention is to use my life, to use your life, to use everybody's life who's online. God's intention, right, is for our lives to be full of great fruit. He wants our lives to be powerful instruments for him related to the kingdom. In fact, the works that we do can actually build on and move forward the works that Christ started. Can't do it without him, but it, it were greater works than these. And what he says is that every experience in our lives the good and the bad, the hard and the easy, the pleasant and the painful, God, every single experience is a part of God's process of preparing us, pruning us to produce more fruit. And it transforms the way that you look at what's going, what's going on, right? Because every experience that we're having, some of you are having really rough moments. People have lost jobs. You know, we, we haven't seen our older son and daughter-in-law for 14 months because of COVID. Last time we saw them was our youngest son's wedding, right? And they just live a car a day's drive away. But we haven't seen them. There's, that doesn't compare, compare, I know, to losing your job. and other things. Some of us are having really hard moments. We have a family in our church right now who's ready to, to lose a parent. It's just a very difficult time. Hard times. When we back up. If we remember the things that Jesus has said, every single experience that we have in life is a part of God's academy for teaching us how to be more fruitful for him. And that changes the way you see it, and it helps his joy to fill our joy in our lives. Does that make sense? Right? I mean, we, we, when we experience pain, right, it's one thing, but when you experience pain after a surgery, it's a whole different thing, right? Because you know that the pain is related to the healing process, you know, the recovery process. And it changes the way you see it. You still want to manage it. You want to minimize it. But it's a whole different thing than knowing, I don't know why I have this pain. I'm gonna, you know, it, it changes it. Jesus says, I want you to understand that God is at work in your life through the pleasant and the painful, through the hard, the easy, the good, and the bad, and you're going right down with all the adjectives, and everything he's doing is prepping you so that, he can, so that you can experience more of his fruit in your life. It's good stuff. One last point. And this comes out in John chapter 14, verse 26. So I'm jumping back and forth in these chapters. And again, it's not an exhaustive list, but at the very end, Jesus is saying, you know what, I'm giving you, I'm giving you guys a lot of stuff fast. It's right, like drinking from a fire hose, right? Most of it's going around you, and the rest of the time you feel like you're getting waterboarded, right? And so it's just coming at him fast. He says, all right, so just chill out, because here's the promise I'm going to make to you. But the counsel of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he'll teach you all things, remind you of everything I have told you. We've got a tour guide. Right? We, we, we have a mentor within us, around us, and with us all the time is saying, this is the way towards joy. This is the way towards joy. This is what you got to remember, right? And the real question comes down is, are we just even listening? Are we listening to the Holy Spirit, responding to the Holy Spirit, right? That's a whole different sermon, but it's a healthy thing to ask yourself. Are you really responding to the tour guide Right? To the counselor, to the teacher that God has poured into you through your faith in Jesus Christ. All right. I want to wrap up. Our time's wrapping up. Why should you care about joy? Right? You know, I, over my years, I've encountered a few people who just seem to love being miserable. 
Do you know any people like that? You did, somehow they just love being miserable, right? And so no matter what you do, right, you know, it, it, you could lay out the ve- just a, a scrumptious meal in front of you, and, and they could say, oh, there's no this, right? You know, they, they'll find, they're just always, why should you care about joy? Why, why should you be looking to live with joy? I want to give you two quick rant answers, right, why you should care about joy. And these are going to come out of Old Testament ref- references. One of them comes from Psalm 51. And for, so this may be familiar to some of you, maybe not to others, but this is a prayer of David after he's been caught in adultery with Bathsheba. And, and he's in the midst of all the anguish and that kind of stuff that goes with it. And this is what he says in verse 12 of Psalm chapter 1. He says, restore the joy of your salvation to me and sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. Let me connect those things together. Our joy is related to our willing spirit. Our ability to get ourselves back up off the ground when we get knocked down and keep going is related to our joy. Because if we are embracing the misery, we're saying, you know, I might as well just stay down here, right? Because I'm coming back down here anyway, so I might as well just stay here. But so some of our kind of get up and get with it again is rooted in our joy to say, God, you know, God's got better things for me. God's trying to do. And, and so our joy, the joy that we have in the salvation that came to us when Jesus showed up in the manger and died on the cross and was resurrected from the grave, that joy Right? It's supposed to give us our get up and get back in the game kind of attitude. It gives us that willing spirit. Here's the second truth I want to give you. And this comes from Nehemiah chapter 8. It's probably been a long time since anybody's done much reading in the book of Nehemiah. Good stuff, though. And um, in Nehemiah chapter 8, you know, this is in the period where they're trying to come back into Jerusalem after the exile. And they're trying to rebuild the temple. And they're, they're finally reading the law. And the the people are just devastated. Like, like, wow, there's all this stuff that God wanted us to be doing. And and they're just overwhelmed. And and look what he says in verse 10. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. Let me just read this for you. Then he said to them, go and eat. Go and eat what is rich. Drink what is sweet. And send portions to those who have nothing prepared. In other words, they're reading the lesson. Listen, God is speaking to us again through his law. That's something for us to celebrate. Right? They wanted to grieve. They wanted to rip their clothes. Oh, you know, they wanted to, he said, listen, this is a day to celebrate because God is speaking to us against, against his Lord. And then he concludes like this. He says at the end of verse 10, he said, um, he says, since, since today is holy to our Lord, do not grieve because the joy of the Lord is our strength. Right? If, if, if you want to push on to next levels in your journey of faith, if you want to have the strength to overcome some of the stuff that you're struggling with, you know, you're going to find it in joy, right? It's so it's not just to get us up when we've fallen down, but it's also to keep us going when we want to quit. Is we find that rooted in joy, and that's why Jesus said, you know what? I want you to have my joy. I want you to have my joy, and I want your joy to be complete because I want you to get back up and to keep going because you're going to be amazed at what you're going to find if you walk with me. So let me ask you this morning as we wrap up, how's your joy? Is your joy complete? And man, don't don't forfeit your joy. God came in the person of Jesus Christ, born as an infant and laid in a manger, lived the perfect life, died on a cross, was was buried in the tomb and resurrected so that you and I can have a complete joy through the salvation we have in him. Embrace that gift through faith in Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. We'll conclude. God, thank you for the joy that you want us to have. Father, I pray that none of us, myself included, would settle for anything but your complete joy. God, help us to get back up. Help us to keep pushing forward so that your joy can can be complete within us. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand and sing a final song. And for those of you who are online, we hope you'll...
stay connected with us and, 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 and celebrate, and as well as just give a moment for God to kind of settle this truth into you and see what you need to do in response to it. Thanks for being here today. In case you're not familiar with the flows yet, in just a few minutes when the service is over, we'll go out this way and, and, and out to the parking lot and, uh, and, and all that kind of good stuff. I know a few of you will stay around and help do some cleaning, so we'll be ready for the next crowd at 1045. But let's stand together and sing to the God who has spoken to 